Yeah, thanks a lot for this invitation. Um, I'm going to talk about the computable theory of a class of topological groups that has been studied a lot by mathematicians in the last three decades or so. And it's interesting that these mathematicians are actually quite interested in the algorithmic part of that theory. So I'm working with them to develop this. George Willis, for instance, in Newcastle, Australia, and his postdocs, but also people, for instance, like um, Nick Monod has worked on this, and P.E. Capras, well-known names for a lot of you, I think. So I'll give you just some background on Polish groups first, and then tell you what these TDLC groups are, and then begin with the algorithmic theory. So a topological group is just a group with a topo topology and continuous group operations. It's uh, useful to know that each open subgroup is closed because its complement is the union of cosets, uh, and the cosets are also open. So each open subgroup is in fact cloven. Now, if I want the topology to be Polish, I call it a Polish group, and uh, a special role is played by the non-Archimedean groups where you want a basis of the identity that consists of open subgroups and therefore cloven subgroups. So there's a basis of cloven sets. Such a group will be totally disconnected, which just means there's a basis of cloven sets. So these groups are can be described more concretely as closed subgroups of sim n, the topological group of permutations of the natural numbers, where I have to use a topology of pointwise convergence. In other ways, the basis of neighborhoods of the identity is given by saying I fix those finitely many numbers. So these groups are simply the automorphism groups of structures with domain n. Given a closed subgroup of sim n, you can make up the structure where the relations are simply the orbits one by one for different arities of of that uh, of the action of that group on the natural numbers. So we're just talking about the automorphism groups of structures, countable structures, and that explains why these non-Archimedean groups are important in model theory. Okay, now there's been a program to understand Borel classes of closed subgroups of S infinity or sim n, sorry, I used two notations here. So this is the other notation for the permutations on the natural numbers. And here's the list of, or diagram of some classes where the errors simply do not inclusions. Um, so I've been pursuing this program. It's basically two things. Look at a class and see whether it's Borel, a natural class, so should be closed under conjugation or even better under isomorphism. See if it's Borel, and if so, study the complexity of the isomorphism problem, of the isomorphism relation on that class. In the logic block 22, which you can download on archive, I've given this diagram and some definitions of these classes, but here it's just for background. I mean, many you can just read the compact, of course, in discrete groups, so compact subgroups of S infinity, that just means profinite groups. All my groups are separable in this talk. And the locally compact is what I mainly talk about. But the program actually started with um, other groups, oligomorphic groups, which are the ones that uh, for each n have only finitely many n orbits. So those are actually uh, depend on how they embed into S infinity. It's not just a notion up to isomorphism. And uh, there's Rolke pre-compact, which is a generalization of both oligomorphic and compact, and recently even locally Rolke pre-compact, if you know what it means, introduced by Zielinski and he has, and Rosendahl, they have some studies of, of that class. I'm just putting this to tell you these are all Borel classes and, and the, uh, even though oligomorphic and locally compact are, are basically incompatible 
there's still a reasonable Borel class containing both. So for each of those classes, we've looked at the complexity of the isomorphism problem and the first paper with Alekos and Katrin Ten showed that the isomorphism relation on profile groups is actually as bad as it can get, namely it's Borel equivalent to isomorphism of countably infinite graphs, which is quite trivially an upper bound and uh, for all of those classes. Um, so you think maybe that's the case always, but in fact, for oligomorphic groups, we have a better upper bound. In this JML paper, we showed that this class of oligomorphic groups has an isomorphism relation that's essentially countable. So it's Borel below a countable Borel equivalence relation. So that means much lower than graph isomorphism, uh, which isn't even Borel, of course. So we're still looking for a lower bound to, to know whether it can be smooth. Actually, we think it's not smooth, but if so, that result would be superseded, but not a methodology because the idea was here to get away from the uncountable structure and replace it by a countable structure of approximations, which we called coarse groups. And uh, in this talk, I will sort of develop this notion to meet groupoids, which is an appropriate structure of, of approximations for locally compact groups. And it can also be defined for all these other classes. And you could get a Borel duality between these uncountable groups in that class and countable structures of approximations. And then, excuse me, where, where will profinite groups will sit in the diagram? Above everybody? Sorry, what's the question? What about the profinite profinite is the con Yeah, but that's the same as the sit in, the, in the, your diagram. Uh, uh, Raphael, do you can you rephrase the question? I have a problem understanding. I think I think uh, Alberto is uh, saying that he doesn't see the profile groups in the diagram. Oh no, because all these are totally disconnected. So compact and totally disconnected means profinite. Yeah. All these are closed subgroups of S infinity and therefore totally disconnected. You can show that profinite is equivalent to compact and totally disconnected. Okay, okay. So profinite is synonym of compact as far as we stop those, right? As far as we look at closed subgroups of infinity, which I do here. Okay. Yeah. Of course, it's not the original definition, but it's equivalent to it. Yeah. All right, so that's a bit of the background. And now I give you a really brief intro to totally disconnected locally compact groups. So these letters just mean what I say, locally compact. So that's certainly an important class, locally compact groups. You can do harmonic analysis and it's been studied for a long while, but usually the groups were connected. So you get all these things on Lie groups and so on. And only more recently, people had looked at a totally disconnected case seriously only since the work of Willis and others. So these two notions together imply Polish. Uh, there was an early theorem on these groups by Van Danzig in 1936, and he showed a very useful fact that if I have a TDLC group, then there's a compact open subgroup. And in fact, then a neighborhood of basis of neighborhoods of one consisting of compact open subgroups. So this is a kind of nice notion with the tension in it because compact means small and open usually means big in a topological group or implies big. So these are small and big at the same time. Uh, of course, if G is discrete, then this is just the identity, the trivial subgroup, but usually, I mean, in, in the interesting cases, it's not discrete and so it's great to know that there is such a particular special type of subgroup. So non-Archimedean means there's a basis of uh, open subgroups. And now we get a specially nice non-Archimedean. We have a basis of compact open subgroups, basis of neighborhoods. So we get back to this theorem. It's not too hard to prove. So here's some examples, all countable, all Oh, 
sorry, this, this is actually examples of computable TDLC groups already, which I haven't defined yet. I meant to take this out the slide. So just forget computable for now. All profile net and all discrete groups are TDLC, uh, where the trivial or the where G itself or the trivial subgroup are the compact open subgroups given by von Danson. The periodic numbers, ZP is the compact open subgroup. Lots of examples. Take a semi direct product of QP by Z, where the generator of Z acts as multiplication by P. So shift along QP in some sense. So that is TDLC. And still, ZP is a compact open subgroup. And now you can make algebraic groups over this QP, which is a field. Uh, so SLN QP and all the other stuff will be TDLC, with the obvious compact open subgroup. Jack Tietz introduced the, well, sort of as the beginning of a theory of buildings, the RTD, which is the automorphism of a group of a homogeneous undirected tree of degree D. So every vertex has degree D and uh, no cycles and connected. So that's, these are quite special and studied a lot by the TDLC people. Uh, so that's an interesting group and it is actually computable as uh, uh, hopefully will convince you. You can just take any countable locally finite graph and get more examples. So examples of these TDLC groups abound. Question? The stabilizer of a vertex is the compact open subgroup here. Okay, so I've defined a notion and given you lots of examples, and now we want a computable theory. We've already mentioned that a lot of examples are computable in some intuitive sense, but what does it actually mean formally? How can I define a computable presentation of a TDLC group and which groups have such a presentation? Once I'm done with that, I want to ask which derived objects like the Haar measure, modular function, scale function is computable. I'll tell you what this is. You probably haven't heard of that one, or at least many of you. Many constructions lead from TDLC groups to new TDLC groups. Do they have algorithmic versions? I.e., do I have nice closure properties in that class? In the paper, the 50-page paper that all this is based on, sorry, 45 pages, we also ask about unique presentations, but I won't have time for that. So I guess really many I talk about question A, how to define a computable presentation. In fact, I do it in two ways. I define two notions of computable presentations. So does it mean I don't know what I mean? No, actually I show these are equivalent in a very nice uniform sense. The first notion is pretty much standard using path on a certain tree and standard notions of computability are weighed in the uncountable setting. TTC groups are uncountable unless they are discrete. So the interesting ones are uncountable. So that's that's possible, but of course you feel more comfortable perhaps with computability in the countable setting. And so the other approach just uses a countable structure of approximations to elements the aforementioned meet groupoid. And this domain I can tell you now is the compact open cosets of G. I know there are lots of compact open subgroups, but I actually also want their cosets. Each open subgroup has only countably many cosets, so it's still a countable structure. And I, I tell you what the algebra on that structure is. Can I pause? Am I understandable? Like, do you understand what I say? At least the words. Is it too fast or? That's fine. It's fine. That's okay. Fine. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. If not, interrupt me. So as I said, all these examples on the previous slide have computable presentations. However, for discrete groups and profile groups, it's the same as what we knew before. So there are also groups such as discrete groups with unsolvable word problem, which cannot have a computable presentation. 
So I tell you what these derived objects are, Kelly Evans graphs in the compactly generated cases. And I show if there, there's a computable presentation, then these derived objects are computable, but the scale function isn't always. So it's a native notion to TDRC groups, which is important. Many papers about it, and we built an example where it's not computable. And briefly at the end, I'll tell you why, for instance, with select construction in this proceedings of the LMS paper, all have algorithmic versions. Okay, so what's the computable structure in the basic countable case that goes back to the 1960s by both Russia and the United States, who were enemies then? Um, yeah, so computable structure is pretty much, well, computable relations and functions on the natural numbers. You can encode if the elements are something else, the elements by natural numbers. I want to be a bit more generous and allow a computable subset as the domains and the functions and relations on that subset should be computable. Just makes the notation easier and allows finite structures as well. So then the computable structure is computable presentable if some computable structure is isomorphic to it and such a structure is called a computable copy. Lots of people do this. This has a long tradition in uh, Novosibirsk, going back to Malsev and Vienna, KPRC, lots of people do this. Uh, yeah, so GLK of Q, for instance, has a computable copy and pretty much most things you can write down. Now in the uncountable case, we can look at what they're doing, for instance, computable analysis. And what they do there is represent elements of that uncountable structures by names. Names are directly accessible to computation of Turing machines. But I don't mean the names are finite, that's impossible. They're actually infinite strings of, of symbols and the Turing machine has tapes that can hold those strings as infinite inputs. And it will compute with it and compute as much as you want of the output. Usually the names are paths on a tree of natural numbers. So a nice tree, computable, no dead ends, hopefully. Um, the names will be the set of paths on such a tree. And then I can define computability of elements of the structure by looking at the names and say the functions are computable as seen on as functions on names. That sounds more abstract than that it is because you all know the, the Cauchy names, a uh, Cauchy sequence construction of the real numbers. So the name for real number is the Cauchy sequence, but in fact, when the, that converges quickly in the sense that the displacement at step n is at most two to the minus n. So the limit of such a sequence is if that's R, then I say the sequence is a name for R. Kotos rationals by natural numbers, of course, to get names in the sense above. And now you can show that R with the field operations and plus and times and say also exponentiation is a computable structure. The Turing machine for exponentiation just uses any of the series, like the sum of the inverses of factorials. Um, to compute the exponentiation and to carry with, no, no, not quite. Uh, just add the members of the Cauchy sequence to get the uh, addition. Okay, so R plus times is computable and is uncountable, great. For profinite groups in the original definition by diagram, people have made an ad hoc definition, Smith and Roach, both in 1981, just took the origin, original definition by diagram. Importantly, they required that the maps between groups are onto. So I want a computable diagram with epimorphisms. Everything is finite, so all this should be computable. Such a diagram exists. It's the same as saying the group is, is computable. So computable profile groups have been studied in the early 1980s already. It's just what you would do if you see the definition, except that you really want that the psi i's are onto, as you get what you could call a recursively enumerable profinite group. And 
what these people did was actually separating the two notions. Okay, so now how to get a computer representation of a TDLC group and what do I want? I want robustness. In particular, I want that, uh, that the existing definitions for the known subclasses uh, carry over. I mean, I get the same notions on those subclasses and I want good algorithmic closure properties. And of course, I want the examples I have to be computable. So I give you two equivalent notions that satisfy all these. And they're uniformly equivalent in the sense that I can turn one presentation into another in an algorithmic way, constructive way. Okay, that's the goal. I will devote maybe 15 minutes on those presentations. The first we call bare presentation as in bare space. So uh, the good news is each totally disconnected Polyspace is homeomorphic to a path set for some subtree of n star. That's the basic fact of descriptive set theory. So I really don't have to distinguish between names and elements. Names are the same as elements here, unlike the case for real numbers. So that's great. The domain of G will simply be the set of paths of a tree T, but not any tree. I want some nice properties that make this path set locally compact in the algorithmic way. So first of all, T itself is of course computable. By the way, N star is the finite strings of natural numbers, right? And this, they're ordered under extensions. So you all know what a subtree is. And I want this tree to be computable and have no dead ends, which, which I should have written separately. And now they, only possible infinite branching is at a root. And above, above such a branching, there's a finitely branching tree. And in fact, I want a computable bound on the width of that branching, depending on the level and on the first entry of the string. The tree above n is finitely branching effectively in n. So you can show that any locally compact totally disconnected space in fact is in fact given by such a tree which only branches infinity at the root. But here I add the computability conditions on the tree. Picture coming soon, but I want that the operations of the group are computable on that tree, which means there's a, for each operation, there's a Turing machine that holds the infinite inputs on read-only tapes. So it can query the input there and the output, like the, the group operation, the, the binary group operation is written on the third tape, say, the, or, or on some output tape. It can only compute finitely many symbol at any stage. And it does that by querying finitely many symbols on the input tapes. So finite to finite, but the overall effect is infinite inputs to an infinite output. Locally finite uh, computation, as computation should be. Okay, here's a picture of these computably locally compact trees. At the root, we have usually infinite branching, say number zero, one, two. You can, you don't need to leave out any numbers. You can if you want, but above one, for instance, it's now a finitely branching tree, which means that cone is, is compact and open. But I also want this computable bound called H which takes W of zero, which is one here, and, and the level I, and then says W of I has to be at most that quantity. So that's effectively locally compact. So that's the definition that works. Uh, and the examples naturally give such a definition uh, of a tree. For instance, QP, the periodic numbers, well, what's, what's the tree? Call it Q here. All the entries except possibly the first are from zero to P minus one, the digits. And also I want 
if the first entry is not zero, then the next entry is not is also not zero. Yeah. So these are easy computable conditions on the string. And the idea is, of course, that R sigma denotes P to the minus R N sigma, where N sigma is simply the integer given by sigma as a P or rather reverse P base P representation. So N sigma is this sum here. So you start with the most significant digit. Uh, what? No, sorry. Start with the least significant digit. Yeah. Other than what you do when you write down uh, the monthly expenses or so. Yeah. So this condition simply says that P does not divide N sigma, because then I could as well take R minus one as the first entry to get a better notation. So it makes it non-redundant. So that's all what what I could give in a, in, if I taught this, if I probably would be in Bologna, I could uh, give this an, as an exercise, yeah. So, um, yeah. Yes, I'll be in Bologna in all, all of September at the ISA and hope to meet some of you there in person or nearby, yeah. Okay, back to this. So you can check that addition and multiplication on QP are computable in the sense stated for more detail, you could look in the paper. So that's the first definition by the bare presentations. And now the best expected one via these neat group points. Again, it starts from Van Danzig. There's the basis of neighborhoods of compact open subgroups uh, of the identity, of course. Uh, so, so I want to introduce an algebraic structure on the compact open cosets in G, meaning the cosets of the subgroups, call this W of G. By the way, if you don't remember, any left coset of something is also right coset of a conjugate. So I just say coset without specifying always uh, left or right. So coset means just that. So I throw in all the compact open cosets and also the empty set to get a natural algebraic structure. And these things are, of course, approximations to elements. The same way as the compact open subgroups approximate one, the compact open cosets now can approximate any element in the group. So what I get is a partially ordered groupoid, the usual set inclusion and multiplication of two cosets if the result is again a coset, which means take the left coset and the right coset of the same group and multiply them. I'll give you more detail, but just keep in mind, well, I'll tell you what a group right is. It's a natural group right that's also a meet semi lattice actually. So, because if you take two cosets, the intersection is again a coset unless it's empty. And of course, compact openness preserved. So you have to meet semi lattice here. So a lot of structure, but in exchange, it's now countable. So, okay, what's a group right? That's an age-old notion. It's actually a category, a small category where every morphism has an inverse, but you can also think it as a partial group. All the group axioms hold except, well, there's no unique identity and the, the operation is simply a partial operation now. It's nice to view it as a category, but it's not category in the sense of describing some big class. It's not like a category of rings. It's a, it's a set category. So you write A is morphism from U to V if U and V are idempotent, meaning U times U is U, and A equals U, A equals AV. So that's how to turn a group right in the classic sense into a category in a definable way. So now think of U and V as subgroups and A as a right coset of the subgroup and the left coset of the other subgroup. So that makes group right for any group really. And now what about the neat part? Well, I throw in the intersection operation, which necessitates, necessitates adding the empty set. And this is a new notion, so I define it here. In a bit more detail, I want these axioms here. So just saying that the empty set doesn't do much with the rest. 
um, if I have two idempotents that are non-empty, then the intersection is non-empty. The inverse preserves inclusion. And one more axiom that also was for Coset, but the best he says that the two binary operations commute. So that that's an exercise to verify for Coset and to get a nice notion. I think it's convenient to add this to the list of axioms. You don't really need to remember this, just that there's a nice algebraic notion. And the main thing is that for any TDLC group, I get a natural meet group wide on the compact open cosets together with the empty set. Meet is just the intersection. And as I said, AB is the usual product in case well, they're both empty, or A is the left coset of B and B is the right coset of D. So then AB is the right coset of the thing that A was the right coset of, and similarly for B. So you can draw this as arrows. AB goes from, from U to W, where A went from U to V, and B went from V to W. That's just what you expect. So, uh, well, the main thing is that I can reobtain the group from the meet group right? right? There's it's a duality. There's an inverse operation taking the meet group right and getting the group back. Um, and using that, just outside computability, you can get some useful results, which I haven't put in it. Well, they're on the logic logs, but also one is in the paper. The automorphism group of G for any, say, locally compact group carries the nice topology, the Braconier topology, which uh, refines the compact open topology. And that's just the one that you need to use. And uh, it's homomorphic to the automorphism group of the meet group right. So that's a nice concrete way to see the automorphism group of G. Uh, and that shows, of course, that it's totally disconnected because W is a counter destruction, uh, which is known otherwise, but it makes it quite uh, transparent why. And another object people study is the Shaboti space, which is a, a compact space defined on the set of all closed subgroups. So similar to stone duality, I can represent the closed subgroups by certain ideals in the meet group right. And they form a closed subset of just two to the W, meaning the, the Cantor space with based on W. So that makes it a compact, totally disconnected space. And it's 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 homeomorphic to S of G. Okay, so you get a nice um, way to see those two objects related to G. Just a second. So by now you should know more or less what a meet group right is, and that for a TDSC group, I get a meet group right out of taking the compact open cosets and uh, trying to sell it here by telling you that the various interesting topological objects can be defined from the meet group right. I haven't told you any detail how to do it. And now how do the, how do I define Computability, well, I say the meet group is, group right is computable, but in an extra nice way, R computable as an R measure. So I first want that the structure is computable, meaning the domain and the operations, including the domain of definition of the multiplication are computable. So just like I defined before in the Matsev Raven sense, I also want that if I take two item potents, meaning subgroups, then uh, the intersection, well, which, which has finite index in U, in the interesting case, uh, actually has computable index in U. So the number of left cosets, say, of U intersect V in U is computable from U and V. U and V aren't really abstract objects, they are numbers. Right? The, the structure is encoded or seen as having domain a subset of N. 
So those things have to be computable. And now I simply define G computably TLDLC via meet group point with W of G as a hard computable copy W. So this sounds quite different from the first definition, but in fact, these two are equivalents. And the difference in definition two is that I directly work with the approximations and it's the natural structure of approximations. It's sort of canonically given by G. First, well, I have one slide explaining why QP and Z split extent QP are computably TDLC via meet group point. I've already told you QP is, uh, is computable in the other sense. So what you do here is simply number all the compact open subgroups. They're just P to the R times ZP for an integer R. And uh, because if I take the quotient, I get the CP infinity, the proof of group, I can number the cosets by saying what its image is in the proof of group. So that gives a nice numbering of all the cosets and that gives the domain of the computable copy of the meet group point. And then you show all the other conditions followed. And for Z split extent QP, you add more cosets corresponding to the automorphism that, that's now given by conjugation. So, so you get these RRZs, which are cosets of UR. Okay. So, so it's checked in the paper that all this is computable. So the source, for instance, the split extension is computable via meet group point. Okay, don't try to read this, that's a bit of notation. And now I want to show you the one main theorem in the paper that the two types are equivalent in the sense that I can obtain a presentation in one sense from a presentation in the other uniformly. Uh, sorry, is it? Yeah. Just look at it a little longer. This is highly useful to understand these groups because you can always take the version that's convenient. Even to find examples is useful. So briefly how I proved, how we proved this, given the meet group point, uh, rather a hard computable copy of the meet group point, which I will just identify with W of G, the inverse operation takes sort of the left automorphisms of W. So it takes all the permutations of, of N, which I think of as the domain of the meet group point that, that have this property, P of A times B is equal to B of A times B inside. This defined equivalent on both sides. Yeah. So it's the automorphisms when I fix B. So where I make the product a partial unary operation so show this, this group is isomorphic to G and actually get a computable bare presentation out of this. Uh, well, you have to be a bit careful because be, being onto is, is not a property given by a, a set of paths by itself. That's well known, it's just uh, G delta. So you, you actually need to make a tree that has both the automorphism or the permutation and its inverse in it. But that's pretty standard, so the tree has path of pairs of permutation and inverse satisfying these conditions. That's all finitary. So it's certainly a, a closed set of paths and you can show that it's a computable bare presentation as required. And the other direction, now I'm given the computable bare presentation and I want to meet group right out of it. So, uh, well, the domain is now finite sets of non-empty strings. Perhaps you want to look at this picture again. Sorry, I have to flip back a few number of slides, which one should never do. So finite sets of strings in this picture, but not the empty string. Maybe one here, one there, one there. So these are exactly the compact open subsets of G. Don't look. Uh, I'm done with this 
it's just a very short sketch. Maybe the proofs are several pages. So, uh, so the domain of this meet group point consists of codes for finite sets of non empty strings, meaning codes for compact open subsets. But not everything, you also want that this is actually a coset. Using that it's the computer with bare presentation, you can decide that condition. So we can decide it's a coset and also compute with them, like intersections and stuff. So using the hypothesis on this bare presentation, I can show it's a hard computer meet group point. Again, a lot of details missing here. There's a nice corollary to that direction. Actually, the action of, of G on its meet group point is computable, where G is completely presented as the set of paths of some uh, computably locally compact tree, and the meet group point is really a structure on natural numbers. So I can take G and A and send it to GA, the left action, and also AG. And this operation is now computable in the right sense, keeping in mind that G is an infinite object, but standard notions of computable. So that's good to know because now in the last 10 or so minutes, I want to tell you about, oh, no, I want to tell you first about this paper with Martino and the same Malnikov, what happens in the abelian case. So, in the abelian case, things are quite a bit simpler because that compact open subgroup is, of course, normal. And I can just view G as an extension of a abelian profile group by a discrete group. And now G is computable with TBLC, just if that situation is computable. So there's a computable profile group and a computable discrete group in the previously known senses, so that G is a topological extension of L by K, meaning that's this exact sequence, L by K, yeah, not K by L. Both terminology, both ways I use, but uh, I mean that L is the quotient, yeah. So, um, and the computable co-cycle has to be, the co-cycle has to be computable. So the, it's a computable extension of the computable profinite extending the computable discrete group. So that's satisfying because that's what you would use as a definition if you were only in the abelian setting. And it's really nothing new. It's the same as what we have in the general setting. So that's great. And now I want to tell you about algorithmic properties of objects associated. And I use this corollary that the action on a meet group point is computable. So what do people look at? A modular function, very important for the, um, in locally compact groups. So that uses that as a unique left harm measure on uh, up to a constant, multiplicative constant. But if I hit the set from the right by G, I get another left harm measure. So the modular function tells you what that constant is for between the two harm measures. Yeah. So in other words, that of G is mu of u g divided by mu of u, where u is really whatever you want of positive measure, say a compact open subgroup. So I uh, standardize assuming that mu is rational valued, which means, well, mu of u is, is one, say, and therefore all the values on, uh, on compact open cosets are rational. That's what I mean here by rational value. So then, uh, then it's clear from the previous that this hard, this modular function is computable. So mu is computable just by its definition, but since the right action of G on W is computable, we observe that the modular function as a function from the set of paths to Q plus is computable. So be careful, this is always or in general, at least infinite inputs, right? So it means really that delta can take an infinite path and decide what it wants to be 
just looking at a sufficiently long finite initial segment. Right? After seeing 20,000 symbols, it says, oh, the modular function is two thirds. So that function is computable, great. Um, so compactly generated means just that, algebraically generated by a compact subset. That's an important subclass. You can easily show it's the same as there's a compact open subgroup and the rest just a finite generating set, which you can assume to be close on an inversion. So that compact set can just be U union S, where S is finite. And given such a situation, you define the Cayley Evers graph, which is pretty much the obvious TDLC variant of the Cayley graph, namely blur everything by putting U on the right. U means blurring, and then it becomes a countable object, which sort of incorporates the large scale geometric structure of G. So the Kelly Abyss graph is, uh, has as a vertex set the left cosets of U, and as an edge relation, well, the usual Kelly graph edge relation, but U on the right everywhere. So that's a very important object, and they're all quasi-asymmetric, as one learns uh, when by looking at the literature. So from the fact that the meet group point is uh, computable, we can show that the, any Cayley Abel's graph has a computable copy. So the CA graph is computable always. And in fact, different versions are computably quasi-isometric. So that's all nice to know. Um, so that leaves the scale function. Is there a question, Rafael? Any question? I I don't think so. Mm -hmm. Is there any question so far? Anything on chat? On chat? Uh, I I don't see any messages on the mm -hmm. chat. So yeah. All the right. idea of of local and global is I mean local or fine structure given by the profinite compact open subgroup and large scale structure given by, well, pretty much the Kelly Abel's graph and the interplay between those two, that's what makes the theory interesting. And the scale function also looks in some sense at this interplay. So let's let's take a compact open subgroup of G, which is always a TLC group and take some element and see, well, how far does conjugation by G move that compact open subgroup. So that concept was introduced by George Willis in 1994 in a, what could be pretty much seen as a founding paper or a collection of papers for the modern theory of GDLC groups. So let's define M of G V as, well, take the index of V intersect V G in V G. Since all this is compact, the index is certainly finite. And the scale is the least such number. So the minimum over all M of G Vs, where V ranges over the quantity many compact open subgroups. So um, if G is discrete, it's trivial. It just, um, I mean, there's a normal compact open subgroup, then it's trivial. You only want to really look at the example without normal open subgroups to make this interesting. But many examples don't have no, normal open subgroups and uh, normal compact open subgroups. So even C split extent by QP has an interesting scale, namely the the, um, the conjugation by this generator of G that multiplies by P has actually scale one, but in its inverse has scale P, which means it's not unimodular. Um, yeah, okay, so from all the stuff above, it follows that the scale function is computably approximable from above. So that's now also a trivial observation because you can just search through all the compact open subgroups and and see how you how low you get, and eventually you hit the uh, right value. Eventually, it will settle on the minimum. So that's what I mean by computably approximable from above. It was open for maybe a year, whether it can be non-computable for some example, but Willis already had an example where the scale function on the automorphism group, so in the more general sense, with the Braconia topology is not continuous. And we used 
that example together with some computability and, and instructions to show there's a computable presentation of a TDLC group so that the scale function is not computable. So that's quite interesting. Um, Again, it's computable on a non-computable in the uncountable sense, but I can make it more concrete. What we really do is we define a uniformly computable sequence GN of elements of G, given concretely by computable path on that tree representing G, so that if N is not in the halting problem, this scale is two, and if it's in the halting problem, then the scale is one. Yeah. So this scale can decide the halting problem and is therefore not computable. It's still unknown whether this is really just a one presentation of the same group and maybe some other presentation has a computable the scale. So we, we, want, we want to show or ask as an open question whether I can make a G where each computable presentation has non-computable scale. But this is, of course, representation dependent. Ideally, we want a unique computable presentation when this happens. So then it's inherently non-computable, where unique has a technical definition, which can be found near the end of the paper. Okay, so that's the derived objects. And just briefly, the closure properties. So this Philip Veselek introduced elementary groups, which are TLC groups that can be obtained from profile and discrete using certain operations. And these operations are uh, quite interesting by themselves or constructions. And here we show that they're all algorithmic. Passing to closed subgroups, taking group extensions via continuous actions, meaning split extensions here. I forgot the right split. Forming local direct products and also taking quotients by closed normal subgroups. So all these have algorithmic versions where, for instance, you say the subgroup has to be computable, and then they say the resulting group is computable TDLC. The first three are quite straightforward, just takes a bit of work, like a, a page for those local direct products. But the last one was quite difficult. So it says in detail, if I if, um, if I have this computable presentation of G and I have a closed normal subgroup in the sense that it's three is a computable subgroup of the tree for G, then G divided by N is also computably TDLC. The problem is there's no obvious way of representatives. Or there's no obvious computable set of representatives. So you can't do that. In fact, what we do is we use the meet group point. We build a hard computable copy of the meet group point of the quotient group. And along the way, we have to decide whether for compact open sets, K is contained in L in the quotient. So whether K is contained in NL. So that was the main problem. So that's a bit of technical work. And that's really all. Here are the references also on the, the background in non academician groups uh, and the paper which we have submitted and can be found on archive. Okay, there's lots to be done. In fact, we, uh, we hope to collaborate with Willis and maybe other people on getting this going and perhaps even have polynomial time presentations or even practical presentations using MAGMA or GAP to, for, for some of these groups at least. So that's that's in the future. Okay, so that's it. Thank you. Thank you. So, are there any questions? Yes, there is a question here in, in Turin. Uh, uh, I should stop can sharing. Can you, can you give an idea of uh, what? the group showing that there is in, which which has a non-computable scale function is um yeah i wish i had my uh, whiteboard here to uh, unfortunately i don't have that um i can describe it it starts from willis's example 
which use the um, Laurent series over F2, where F2 is the field of two elements. So the uh, meaning not just power series, also um, negative exponents up to some finite uh, negative degree. So, um, so what Willis did was looking at certain automorphisms on, on the abelian groups of these Lorentz series over F2. And uh, he made a sequence where the scale uh, sort of flips, the, the sequence converges, Sn converges to S in the Braconia, but the scale is, um, the scale is, how was it? is two and then for the limit is one. Yeah. And we use that construction and, uh, but make an effective version by taking an input N for the halting problem. And as soon as N turns out to be in the halting problem at some stage, we build a compact open subgroup that's left invariant by the automorphism, meaning the scale goes to one. And otherwise the scale is two, uh, well, by the way, the automorphism is constructed in Willis. So for each n, we have a group, and then we put them all together using these local direct products, which we have shown to preserve computability. So the overall group has sort of a piece for each possible input to the holding problem. And that's these GNs here I mentioned. Um, here, yeah. GN is just, comes from the nth component of the group. So again, this is an appendix to the paper, which is an archive, and it's, it's really not that hard. So it's uh, anybody who actually looks at that and uh, asks me a question by email, I'm more than happy to answer it. I can't draw a picture here, which would help, but would take a bit of time to, so uh, I only can answer verbally. Sorry for that. Yeah. All right. Is there is there any other question? Maybe maybe a, a clarification here from Udine. Uh, so you show that there is this uh, this group where the scale function is computed by by the halting set. Uh, I understand correctly that this is true everywhere. But I mean, the halting set will compute any scaling function, right? Because you can approximate. Yeah, yeah, that's absolutely correct. Yeah. That's the so upper that's bound because the sharpest you can get. I mean, that's the most you can get. I mean, you can get you cannot go farther than exactly. that, right? Okay. It's as bad as it can get because the scale function is approximable from above, which means the halting problem can can see when it has attained its limit. That that's the question the halting problem can answer. Right. So yes, zero prime or halting problem is as bad as it can get. All right, uh, is there other questions, remarks? Well, if not, let's uh, thank Andre again. Yeah, thanks. It's been a great experience to do this.